African Americans were denied equal service at a Wichita lunch counter, students, organized by youth leaders, executed a sit-in in protest in 1958, even though their efforts were not supported by the national NAACP. Through amazing persistence, these individuals silently waited for their right to be served, effectively performing the first successful student-led sit-in, inspiring a long chain of sit-ins across the nation. The Wichita, Kansas of the early 20th century was one of the most segregated communities in the state. Located near the Oklahoma border, Wichita tended to reflect Southern views, although racism was more subtle than in the Deep South, without signs to deny service. But it would be made plain and clear once you sat down and someone might walk by you two or three times before they finally would get the idea that you were there for other than holding that seat down and would just politely tell you uh, that we don't serve colored here. Black families lived in the northeast part of the city where they operated their own businesses. Despite an 1874 state law prohibiting unequal service in public places, all of the downtown restaurants discriminated against African Americans. Several unorganized attempts were made to change the discriminatory policies at different stores in the city, but these efforts had no effect. Dockham Drugstore was one of the most prominent chains in Wichita. A part of the Rexall franchise, Dockham operated nine stores in the city, and the downtown location was the place to go for hungry workers and shoppers. Here, white patrons always took precedence over black customers, who were forced to order from a window at the end of the counter and take their food outside. Ron Walters and his cousin, Carol Parks, grew up in Wichita. Carol's mother, Vivian, was president of the local NAACP. The Parks' home frequently hosted national black leaders, including Rosa Parks and Franklin Williams, who shared their experiences with Ron and Carol, inspiring them to pursue issues in civil rights. As college students, in 1958, they became president and vice president of the Youth Council, and Chester Lewis became chapter president. Ron and Carol shared their ideas with Lewis and the Youth Council, they proposed that the group conduct a sustained sit-in at Dockham Drugstore to change their policy. To ensure that this effort would be successful, Ron carefully organized and planned the protest himself. He wanted to follow tactics of the Montgomery bus boycott, sitting quietly and not reacting to taunts. To do this, he trained the students for several weeks at a local church to prepare for the difficult situations that might occur. We used the basement of that church uh, to, uh, to simulate of what it would be like to sit on the stools, uh, what we would encounter. Would people you know, try to uh, pour coffee down our back or cigarettes, burns or taunts, uh, just what would happen. And uh, we were able to, uh, to, to design this so that we then were the perpetrators and other people who sat on the stools had to react. Uh, the point was not to react. Uh, the point was to sit uh, with dignity. Uh, and uh, with purpose, uh, and to not be dissuaded. Ron spoke at local churches, high schools, and organizations to recruit volunteers to participate. Through his efforts, he was able to encourage as many as 40 members to take part in the sit-in. When Vivian Parks and Chester Lewis explained to the national office what the students would be doing, the NAACP strongly advised them to discontinue their efforts because the organization worked through legal means and not protests. Ron was not discouraged, and he proceeded with the plan. Carol Parks was the first to sit down at the Dockham Drugstore lunch counter on a test visit. She ordered a Coke and the waitress, mistaking her for a white patron, served her. When Carol's friend sat down beside her, the waitress asked, Honey, you're not colored, are you? Carol replied, Yes, I am. The waitress then ignored the customers. The following Saturday, July 19th, the sit-in began and students filled the lunch counter stools from just before lunch to closing time, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. They were occasionally supported by picketers outside. Each week that we went, I, I think there was a heightened sense of consciousness and uh, uh, anxiety about what, what might happen. Um, but we tried to go about it in a very diplomatic and uh, um, serious way. During the sit-in, there was relatively little coverage in the media. B 
Because Dockums was a major advertiser, neither of Wichita's two daily newspapers wished to offend them. Although one did run a small article towards the end of the sit-in, Wichita's black weekly newspapers ran a few stories that were carried by the Associated Press, and one Wichita radio station did an interview with the participants. Three weeks into the sit-in, a small group of white youths came into the store to start a fight. The black students called the police, but by the time they arrived, the white youths had left. Two days later, a larger gang arrived, antagonizing the students and destroying protest signs. Ron went to a payphone and called the police department. However, the officer that arrived told them that he was to keep his hands off. Instead, Ron called Turner's Drugstore, the group's base, for assistance. Three carloads of black students arrived in support, and the white youths immediately departed. Lewis called an emergency meeting for the parents and students to calm their fears. The students described their efforts and the plan to expand their hours. They were pleased to find that the community was behind them. The next morning, at 10 a.m., August 11, 1958, as the students took their places, the manager walked in and announced, Serve them. The students who were sitting at the lunch counter when the policy changed sat silently and celebrated their victory with a Coke. Well, it made you feel good, but you didn't have to stand up and carry out your food that you could sit down and fellowship and enjoy a Coke or sandwich or something. After weeks of effort, Dockham Drugstore finally served all patrons. The change not only affected the downtown Dockham, all nine stores in Wichita were desegregated, and because Dockham was a part of the statewide Rexall chain, all Rexall stores in Kansas changed their policies. Early on in the Dockham sit-in, others had shown interest in how the students were conducting their protest. The Oklahoma NAACP state youth director contacted Lewis to ask for details. The weekend after the policy changed at Dockham, Lewis and Ron described their efforts at an NAACP convention in Oklahoma City. A few days later, the Oklahoma City Youth Council, led by their adult advisor, Clara Looper, began a two-week sit-in at Katz Drugstore. They followed practices similar to those that Ron had established. With 30 stores in Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa, the Katz Drugstore eventually abolished its discriminatory policy. Looper went on to speak at the 1959 NAACP National Convention to share her story, where North Carolina University student Ezel Blair was in attendance. Two years after the Oklahoma sit-in on February 1, 1960, Blair and three other college students took their seats at a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina to protest racial discrimination. The students had drawn inspiration from the efforts of Looper and those who protested at the Katz Drug Store. This North Carolina sit-in attracted media attention from across the nation and spurred the sit-in movement in the South and an early phase of the Civil Rights Movement. Despite this widespread movement, the Wichita Youth Council's efforts were not recognized by the national NAACP for years. Finally, in 2006, the students were given credit for being the first successful student sit-in. They celebrated the recognition at the 50th anniversary of the effort, which culminated in a march through downtown Wichita past the former Dockham Drugstore to Chester I. Lewis Memorial Park, one block away from where they had stood to order their lunch. Ron Walters went on to earn a PhD in International Studies, and he currently serves as a professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. He has held positions of distinction at major universities and has become a renowned author and political commentator for several news organizations, including CNN and NPR. Because of Ron Walters' leadership in the Wichita NAACP Youth Council, he has become known as the father of the modern sit-in. This 1958 effort at the Dockham Drugstore became the first successful student-led sit-in in the nation, inspiring a long chain of sit-ins across the country, placing Ron and the Youth Council participants among the many leaders of the civil rights movement and the fight for equality.